So if we are solving that first equation for m, we need to start by adding b to both sides. So we have y plus b is equal to mx, and then we need to divide both sides by x. So we get that m is equal to y plus b divided by x. So apparently, um, this is the formula for uh, this is just slow finish up form of a line. That's minus b instead of plus b, so that doesn't really matter. Uh, so apparently this is one way to find the slope of a line uh, if you've got a different piece of information. For the second one there, if we're solving that for b, we should begin by subtracting the a squared. What formula is this? The original one. Staggering theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, so if we're solving for b, we need to subtract a squared and then take the square root. <coughs> In general, when we take the square root, we need to remember to include the positive and the negative. Okay, anytime you take a square root, don't forget the positive and the negative. Alright, so as I mentioned before, we're going to need this for what we're doing today. <clears throat> so we're going to find inverse functions. We're going to look at a couple of different types of functions and their inverses. So first of all, let's just start with some definitions. <clears throat> first of all, the definition of a function to be a function, not just a relation, to be a function, each element of the domain is paired with only one element of the range. Now that sounds a little weird, so probably makes a little bit more sense to say that for every x, there is only one y. You don't have any repeated y values for a single x value. You may be familiar with using the vertical line test to determine if something is a function. If you take a vertical line and slide it across your function, it should never touch the graph in more than one point at a time. If it passes that vertical line test, then it is indeed a function. Well, what an inverse function does is it switches the domain and range, where it switches your x values and your y values. They exchange places. We use this notation, okay, f with a negative one exponent, but it's not a negative one exponent. That's the inverse notation. Okay, it's read as the inverse of x, not f to the negative one x. Okay, it's not a power, it's an inverse notation. So the illustration that I have here. Um, is the first one is of the absolute value function. Okay, if these are x values to begin with, uh, on the left side, I don't have a line of x underneath it, but to begin with, these are your x values on the left side. This is just a map um, representing the function. Okay, negative 3 and positive 3 is what's on the absolute value of x. Both of them have a y value of 3. That is okay. You can have multiple x values that have the same y value. You just can't have uh, more than one y value for each x value. So we're okay there. But if we talk about its inverse, if we flip x and y, so now these are our x values here on the right side, its inverse is not a function because each x value, okay, 1, 2, and 3, have multiple y values, 3 max to negative 3 and positive 3, we're talking about the inverse of the absolute value of x. Okay, so the absolute value of x is a function. Uh, <clears throat> absolute value of x is a function. Its inverse is not. Um, but the second example here, this g of x function, x plus 3, okay, um, we can see that each x value has only one y value, and vice versa, if we talk about its inverse, if we go, if we say that the column on the right is not the x values, 
they have what they want to buy value. So G of X is something that we call one to one. If a function, or excuse me, if the original is a function and the inverse is a function, it's what we call one to one. Each X has only one Y, each Y has only one X. Okay, so G of X is one to one, F of X is not. Okay. So let's look at these graphs here, graphs 1, 2, 3, and 4. We've got four different types of functions. First of all, let's identify what type of functions these are. Uh, what type of function is graph 1, or f of x equals 2x plus 1? What type of function do we call that? Linear. Okay, it is linear. What do we call number 2? 1 over x squared. One of the ones we did this year. Starts with an R. Not radical. Radical has a square root. It was close to that word. Rational. Okay, we get the rational functions. When there is a variable in the denominator, it's a rational function. Okay, what about graph three? What type of function is that? Okay, the graph is a parabola, but we call the function quadratic. And what about graph four? Graph 4 is a cubic function. Okay, graph 4 is a cubic function. <clears throat> so, graph 1 there, is its inverse also a function? Yes, it is. Okay, graph number 1, its inverse is also a function because every y value has only one x value. So what about graph number two? No, it does not. Um, for example, if we look at y equals four, y equals four in two places. So if we switch the x and y values so that the y values become the x values, then you have x equals four twice. So number two, <coughs> it's, um, excuse me, it's uh, inverse is not a function. How about number three? Nope, same reason, okay, we could pick a different y value we could talk about when uh, y is 10, there are clearly two places where y equals 10, or we could talk about when y equals 20, okay, um, so number three, it's inverse is not a function, and how about number four, nope, same thing, okay, same thing, um, there are multiple places where the y values are repeated, so really only Function number one has a inverse that is a function. Part B, though, says for each function that does not have an inverse, see if you can describe a restricted domain so that the resulting function does have an inverse. <clears throat> so I'm going to walk you through this one. Number one, we're good. Let's look at number two. There's a place where we can kind of cut this function in half, so to speak, so that we still get all the same y values, but we don't repeat it. If we restrict our domain, if we say that x is greater than or equal to 0, if we restrict the domain, that means that we're excluding the left half of the trap. Well, the left half of the trap is 3 of the right half. Um, it's just a mirror image there, so we can restrict the domain there so we can still get all the same values, but this way they're not repeated. Okay, so when we restrict it and they're not considered the left part of the graph, then we're good. Okay, this inverse would be a function for number two. We can do a similar thing for number three. We can cut it off at its axis of symmetry right here at x. And we still get all the same uh, y values, okay? They're just not repeated. So if we restrict number three for x is greater than, uh, I don't it doesn't matter whether you have the equal to or not, um, I'm going to include it. x is greater than or equal to three. We could have also said less than or equal to three. You can consider either half. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter there. Uh, but four, there's not really a place that we can do that with number four. If we try and cut it off here in the middle, 
okay, if we say that x is greater than or equal to zero, okay, we get these values, um, but we don't we don't get these values the same way that we would have here on the left side of the graph. So we cannot restrict the domain um, for number four. This really only works um, <clears throat> for what we call even functions, uh, functions that have symmetry uh, along a vertical axis. Number four does not have symmetry along a vertical axis of two and three. Okay, so that's looking at the graphical side of things. Let's look at the actual process to find the inverse of a function. How do we find it algebraically? Okay, so we've got a couple of steps. They're not very descriptive. Okay, they're just the basic outline. Every single time you want to switch x and y, you're going to solve the equation for y, and then at the end, you're going to replace that y with the f inverse notation. So if we are trying to find the inverse of g of x is equal to 3x, and you may say, well, there's not a y. Well, g of x is just a fancy way of saying y, right? It's just a little bit more, more specific. So, step one, if we switch x and y, that's going to say that x is equal to 3y. Step two says solve the equation for y. So, divide both sides by 3 y is now by itself, so in the final step here, I'm going to go ahead and replace it with g inverse of x, since g of x was what I started with, is equal to x over 3, or that is equivalent to one-third of x. Either way, I'm fine with that. You need to be aware that both of those are equivalent. Okay, so that was a linear function. It didn't have a y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept is zero. Um, let's look at one that's a little bit more involved. Let's look at h of x here. Okay. So, if we switch x and y, we've got x is equal to 3y plus 5. Solving that for y, we need to subtract 5 from both sides. And we're going to divide by 3 again. So h inverse of x is equal to, you can write it as x minus 5 over 3. You can write that as 1 third times x minus 5. You can write that as 1 third x minus 5 thirds. You can write it as x over 3 minus 5 thirds. There are about four different ways that you can write this expression here. But all of them are equivalent. I'm good with any of them. I'm not good with x minus 5 over 3. Okay, let's look at another one. j of x. So x is equal to 3y minus 7. This time start by adding 7. And once again dividing by 3. So j inverse of x is equal to x plus 7 over 3. I'm not going to write it four different ways. I'm just going to leave it right there. Let's look at one more like this. We've got a fraction in there. Nothing mechanics-wise changes, but I just need to point out something. Still start the same way, subtract 4. Now, <clears throat> we've been dividing by 3 every single time because we have 3 times y. Well, this time we have 3 fifths times y. Now, technically you can divide by 3 fifths, but it is better for you to get in the habit of getting rid of that by multiplying by the reciprocal. Okay, multiplying 3 fifths by 5 thirds is going to get rid of that. Um, it's going to give you 1 on the right side, and it's just easier to manipulate those numbers. So 